Hi, Spring fans. Welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. In this installment, we're going to talk about one of the most widely used and yet sort of not widely known parts of the Spring Framework, one of these utilities that's buried just underneath the surface. It gives you an extra bit of indirection, namely the Spring Expression Language. The Spring Expression Language was introduced in Spring Framework 3.0. Remember, friends, we're on 6.1 galloping at this point to Spring Framework 6.2. So when I talk about Spring Framework 3.0, I'm not talking about Spring Boot, I'm talking about Spring Framework. This release came out in, I think, 2009, if memory serves. Uh, and I remember the development of this technology. It was something that was sort of being developed in Subversion. I remember trawling the source code for Spring Framework and uh, looking at all the new stuff and you know preparing a book at the time for A-Press on, on Spring. And I was just looking at this code and I said, oh wow, there's this new thing, this Spring expression language developed by our own Mad Hatter, Andy Clement, I just, I, who I adore. I just uh, so much reverence and, and respect and appreciation for all the amazing things this guy does. Remember, if you've ever used Aspect J, you're using work that he's done. If you've ever used our AOT engine, you're using something he worked on. If you've used uh, uh, the Spring expression, language, you're using something he's worked on. If you've used the Spring Tool Suite or Visual Studio Code with Spring, you're using something that he worked on. He's just everywhere. He's just one of those people that holds the uh, the uh, the platform on his shoulders. He's just, he's, a, he's stellar. One of the things he developed, as I say, was this Spring Expression language. It was contributed to Spring Framework 3, and I remember trawling the Subversion source code commits, you know, just uh, SVN up and looking at all the new code and the, and the milestones and the not yet GA Spring Framework 3, and there, <clears throat> was the Spring Expression language and all of its beautiful glory. It was originally implemented, and I'll never forget this. It's one of the reasons why I so wanted to meet Andy Clement even before I joined the team. It was originally implemented using Antler, which is a de facto standard, right? I mean, everything uses Antler. Antler is like the yak bison combo for Java. Antler is really good, right? It's a, it's a, it's been around for years. It's a, if you want to implement a parser, guess what? You're probably going to use Antler in the Java ecosystem. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Terrence Parr, who, by the way, is a, a professor, or at least he was, uh, at Stanford, or was it Berkeley, one of those Bay Area schools? I should know, I'm in the Bay Area. He famously talked about how he built Antler to save, to automate five minutes worth of work. And, and in so doing, he ended up spending five years of his life, right? It's like, it's, it's one of those things where it's so obviously needed, but it was so painful to do. You would think most sane people would just hew to that tool and use that, and, and and most sane people would. But Andy, my friends, is more than a little, ooh, ooh, you know, and uh, he does amazing things. He has no fear. So he decided to hand roll his own recursive descent parser, which again, for the record, you can do. Smart people can do that. Terrence Parr did it, why can't Andy? But suffice it to say, I was a little skeptical. And there's actually a commit where he rips out the antler code and redoes it all by himself. And I'm just like, oh, what a flex, you know, what a legend, who does this, you know? And actually, of course, the resulting code was better, cleaner, faster. It's just, it's just, you know, just what you'd expect when you look at Andy's work. He wasn't being immodest or anything. He was just trying to do a better job and he always does. And so we have this amazing spring expression language and it came out again at a time where there were already some fairly entrenched players, not least of which were the Java server pages expression language, which is actually part of the standard, not very good, but it exists. The Java server faces, expression language, a bit better, but still not very good. The JBoss, the specific JBoss expression language, which is a superset of the JSF expression language, if memory serves, that was actually pretty good. It had a lot more features, certainly, than those first two. Still not good enough. Uh, we had OGNL, Object Graph Navigation Language, uh, which I was familiar with because I had used Apache Tapestry, and it was already widely used, well, de well developed, etc., prolific. And yet, and yet, we still built our own. And you might wonder why. Well, I know now why. Because so many years later, all those other ones are in varying states of disuse or whatever, but the Spring Expression language is just as awesome as ever, and it has more and more new features, some of which have like appeared, sprouted, just to serve another uh, use case brought on by somebody else using the Spring Expression language in their code base. So for example, Spring Integration at one point wanted compiled Spring expression language expressions. And guess what? You can do that. You can compile Spring expression language code. So today, my friends, we're going to take a look at some of the features of the language and then its use in Spring and, of course, its use in other contexts. Let's dive right into it.
We'll start here. This is the absolute simplest example you can imagine. I'm instantiating a spell expression parser. This is part of Spring Framework spell, right? And using it to then evaluate an expression. So the expression is take the string literal, hello world, concat an exclamation mark to it, and then from the, the, the finished string, get the bytes out. And here, I'm looking at the results and I'm getting the bytes. Well, the bytes, the value I get back is just an object, right? There is a second overload where I can pass in the class literal, the, the class of the thing I want back, in which case I don't need to do this downcast, right? Uh, in that case, if you look at this, it's now a byte array. So this would work either way, okay? Very simple. So message, voila. Okay, so now let's see if this test works. All right, so that worked, great. So we have a, the ability to concatenate, to, uh, uh, to evaluate string literals, to call methods, and to dereference properties. Already, you're, <laughs> you've already got almost everything you need, right? I mean, you can see the power here, and we've just begun, okay? <laughs> Next up, we're going to take a look at some of the support for working with, dereferencing, traversing, and accessing data in arrays or collections or maps. Okay, so same as before, create a Spring expression parser, and here I've got a dereference against a root object, and I don't show the root object. That root object is actually this type. I've got a, a single class here in my code base just for our demo, where I have a class, a record called inventor. And yeah, of course I borrowed this from the documentation. And it's got some properties, some components, name, birthday, nationality, and an array of inventions, okay? And I make very clear that this is an array because I call it array. And I've got an instance of it, a public static singleton instance of that inventor just for our demo, for our tests, where I instantiate the data, passing in a date and a name and the nationality and a, a couple of different inventions in an array of strings, okay? So back to here, I'm gonna dereference the root object dot inventions array, getting the first element and then I'm uppercasing it. Okay, so you can see indexing into an array works as you'd expect. So here I'm saying using this Tesla as the root value. Before I just passed in the string class, but now I'm passing in a root context object and then I'm asking for a string back. And I'm gonna pr prove that the induction motor is indeed the first in, in invention in that array. Good, okay. Going down a little bit further here, I'm literally just using a, an int array literal to, in, you know, to new up an array of integers, okay? Uh, and I'm asking it for, for, for the array back, and uh, that's what's being stored here in this variable. I'm just asserting that the length of four elements is indeed four, okay? Same here, there's actually a special convenient syntax for creating lists, right? And so you can see I've got liberal misuse of spacing here. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking the Spring Expression language to create a list with four elements in it. And, and then I'm getting it back as a list of class. So when I get that, I get a numbered list. And I'm just confirming that it's not null, it's, it's not empty, and that the numbers one through th zero through three are indeed in the collection. And then finally, I'm using the expression language to create a map literal. So this is just like in, like in JavaScript or something like that. I'm creating a map with a key called name and a value, in this case, a string value, Bob. Okay, and I'm, I'm here, I'm asking for the map back and I'm confirming that the map contains a, a key called name and that the name equals to Bob, okay? So we run this test, what do we get? All right, so that worked as well, right? So, and we can try breaking the test, I suppose. We can try breaking the list by removing an element so that the assertion is no longer true, and you can see it fails. So clearly, everything is working as we expect. Okay, you've already seen this before, but it's important to reiterate, you can call arbitrary methods on instance variables in the Spring Expression Language. So here I have a string, I'm calling dot substring, passing in one to three as the range, and that'll give me back the second and the third parameter, right, B and C. The second and the third character, which is B and C. So let's run this. Okay, great, that worked. You you can also use the Spring Expression language to evaluate things, to get truthiness values out of it. I'm using some basic operators to uh, assert certain things. I'm saying, oh, is two equal to two? Sure, right? I expect that to be true. Great, I'm getting a Boolean back. Um, and here, more interestingly, you can actually do sort of sorting order comparisons as well. Is black, does it sort less than block, right? Which is the same word with a Levenstein distance of one because a and O, O comes later, right? And that's true, black is less than block, okay? So let's run this. Hey, convenient, it worked. You can also dereference static variables and, and methods by 
first of all, getting a pointer, a reference to the class literal, right, of the of the type. So T is a special function that when you use it, it if you pass in a, a class, will let you sort of dereference static fields. So dot ceiling and dot floor. So here I'm doing a comparison. I'm saying is ceiling in rounding mode dot ceiling less than rounding mode dot floor. And I'm asking for the Boolean result. Let's just see if that gives us. Okay, great. And this, of course, is also how you get a hold of a, a dot class file. Or And this, of course, is how you get a hold of a dot class reference. Here, here we have another type called a writable inventor, where I have some getters and setters. Before, I was using a record, and that record is only it's only readable. It's, a, it's immutable. Can't write the fields in it. So here I've created a mutable inventor with a setter and a getter. And I'm going to instantiate a new instance. I'm going to call. I'm going to say the name is Nick. And I'll confirm that the name is Nick. Then I'm going to use the spring expression language. And here I'm creating an evaluation context. I'm going to start to see this more often. You can actually control the capabilities that the spring expression language has. So for example, maybe you want your your spring expression language to only do read operations, but no writes, right? Maybe you want to like lock that down so that you can't have that possibility through some mischievous, you know, misuse of the engine. So you can say, I want a simple evaluation context for read, write data binding. Okay. But there are others as well for read only data binding for property accessors. And you can provide the property accessors, for example. So I'm going to do for read, write data binding. And here I'm going to say, given this context, set the variable new name to be Mike. Okay. And so now I've got this context. I'm going to use the expression parser, right? I'm going to call this the spring expression parser. So it's kind of clear what we're doing here. And I'll say parse expression name equals pound sign new name. This is the variable that we defined in the context and we've assigned it to Mike. So we're dereferencing that variable and we're assigning Mike to the name property on the inventor. So I'm going to create the expression, and then I evaluate it basically by passing in this context and then passing in the target object, okay? So now I can dereference the name field on the writable inventor, and I should see that it's been updated to Mike. Okay, great. So let's expand a little bit more on that evaluation context. The evaluation context is super important. It's how you communicate to the Spring Expression Language the surface area of code, functions, variables, etc., that you expect and hope it will have. So here, I'm getting a pointer to a Java reflect method, okay? I'm getting a method pointer for this function right here, this method in my class called add. It's, a, it's called add and it takes two integers. So I'm looking up that method by its name and the arity, the, the parameters, okay? And I'm asserting it's not null, okay? Now I'm creating a standard evaluation context creating two variables, x, which is valued at 10, and y, which is 5, and I'm calling register function, registering in the spring expression language a new function. You can teach it new tricks. I'm registering a new function here called add, and I'm giving it a pointer to this method. Well, now I can do that. I can say spring expression language, parse the expression, pound sign x for the variable name, dereference, and then pound sign y. When I add them together, I should get 10 plus 5 is 15, right? So I'm saying get the value return it as an integer and assert that it's equal to 15. Okay. Same thing here. I'm also calling the function that we just added. It's called, guess what? Add. And I'm passing in as parameters these two different variables. And again, I should expect 15. Okay. Let's see what that one gives us. That seems happy. Great. Okay. Let's go down a little bit more. And let's go down a little bit more and look at a slightly more sophisticated example. Here, I've got a simple evaluation context for read only data binding. Okay. So there's no read and write. And I'm, I'm pre configuring the root object, which is the Tesla pointer we looked at earlier. And here I'm saying parse the expression, look up root dot name, right? And this is synonymous. This is the same as saying just name. Okay. So I'm saying root name and I'm asserting that, you know, this context, by the way, is a builder. At this point, it's a builder of type simple evaluation context dot builder. You have to call dot build. I'm not going to further customize it. So I'm calling build in situ, and I'm then evaluating this expression against that context, expecting a string back. And I'm asserting that the value I get back from the name field, you know, this is this is equivalent to Tesla dot get name is equal to Nikola Tesla. OK, great. Now, this is going to be a little different, though. Here I'm calling a method, which I have no permission to do. Right. I've only got permission to do read only data binding. OK, so I'm going to try this 
you know, I should get a string back. I don't care what it is, but I should get a string back. It'll fail, right? And so we'll see assertions that fail, which is what you want. And then finally down here, I'm going to retry the same expression, but this time with the builder, I'm going to add one more call to configure it to allow the invocation of instance methods. There's a bunch of these methods that you can plug in to override the extent of its access, right? So I'm going to say, allow the read-only property reads, but also allow instance methods, okay? So let's go ahead and run this. Nice, okay? Pretty straightforward so far. In the last example, you saw me use a pound sign root or hashtag root, or you, and you see me just leave it off. Either way, I'm accessing a root object. And you'll see this a lot in Spring, right? We have this all over the place in the framework where we give you a, an expression context, and it's implied that you have access to certain parts in that context that make sense for what you're doing. So for example, in Spring integration, you might have access to the current message. In Spring security, you might have access to the current authenticated principle, okay? So I'm gonna create a Spring expression parser. I'm gonna parse an expression, giving myself access to the name. I'll then look up, I'll evaluate the expression in the context of Tesla, the, the pointer. I'm gonna assert that the name is equal to Nikola Tesla, okay? That's pretty straightforward. We've seen this before, but I just want you to understand what's happening here. We are dereferencing tesla.name there, okay? Here, I can do a, com a comparison and confirm that's working as we expect. Okay, pretty straightforward. All right, now we've got a collection of cats, and we've got one leopard, one tiger, one lion, and another tiger. So there are two tigers out of these four different cat types, okay? And I'm gonna use this as the, the root object, the context for my expression, and I'm gonna then parse the expression. I'll say, okay, iterate through the root object. And here I'm doing a null safe navigation. Okay, I'm saying dereference data in this collection, assuming it's not null. That's, the, that's a very, very convenient way. You've probably seen something like this in other languages as well, okay? And I'm saying, and this is also kind of like XPath, right? I'm saying dereference the, the root object, but then traverse it and select only the things where the type, and remember this cat type has a component called type, this cat class, this record has a component called type, dereference or keep only the cats where the type is equal to tiger. So there should be two, right? I'm getting that back as a list and I'm asserting that there's actually only two results in the resulting collection, let's confirm. There we go, we can see the two that matched and everything else has been discarded, okay? So if you've ever used list comprehensions in Python or something, well, this will feel really right at home. And actually, in a way, you get more type safety out of this than you would in the equivalent Python code. Neat. All right, good. So what else? All right. You've just seen me do a null safe navigation. I, I dereferenced a thing. And if it was not null, I traverse the property and dereference that. And I could keep doing that. I could chain it together. So a dot question mark, b dot question mark, c dot question mark, etc. If anything in the chain is null, then the whole expression returns null. I don't get a null pointer or anything like that. I just get a null immediately. Okay. So it's a safe way to go f as far down the navigation as needed and get an, a null or an actual value. So let's suppose I have another inventor. I'm creating a, this is not Tesla. This is just a bunch of nulls in the inventor type. And I'm going to parse the expression. I'll say, is the name, you know, give me the name, but only if it's not null. If it is null, then give me Bob. Give me the default value. Okay. So this is called the Elvis operator, and you've probably seen it in other languages as well. And basically, we're saying dereference name, but if it's null, give us a default value of Bob. Okay, and this, of course, could be another Spring expression language expression. We're asserting that the return value is actually Bob. Okay, what about this? Here, we've got the array, but it's null. So we're saying, give me the length if it's not null, but otherwise, just give me null. So I'm going to confirm that that's null. Okay, let's try this, run it. Okay, not bad, very easy, very fast. Now you might say, now you might say, hey, what does this have to do with Spring at the end of the day besides the package, right? All this is in the Spring framework, of course, but what does it have to do with Spring? Well, very simple. You can use the Spring expression language to configure your applications and you can use it in your business logic as well. You can use it in a lot of cases to plug in an even more efficient and compact and sort of streamlined alternative to something like a Lambda. So here's an example. Let's suppose I have a Spring Bean of type inventor registry, and it has a public method called get inventors, just returning a collection, in this case a set, of inventors. This is the, uh, the uh, same Tesla pointer we've been looking at before. I've got some configuration here. I'm registering this one bean, the service, as a bean here because I don't have component scanning enabled for the moment. Um, and then I'm gonna create a, a Spring application context 
passing in this config class, which in turn will register, register an instance of this bean. I'm going to then create a spell expression parser and a standard evaluation context. And I'm going to, with the standard evaluation context, set a bean resolver. You can do whatever you want. This is actually a valid bean resolver. Given the context and the bean name, look up the bean definition somewhere, right? And the, the result it's looking for is the actual object itself. So you, you know, if you have some other technology, in theory, you could use this, but you know, dollars to donuts, you're probably going to be using Spring. And if that's the case, then we have an implementation for you that will dereference. It'll look up the bean in a bean factory. And guess how this is implemented? How much you want to bet? It's basically the same as what I just did. You're right. It is, right? So this is a pretty trivial, pretty trivial thing. It works just fine. Okay. So now, given all of that background, we've got a Spring expression parser that will know to look up beans in the bean context when they appear. Well, how do I mention a bean? Well, you proceed it with at. So I've got this bean, it's called a registry. And you, by the way, you can always change the name, right? You can always say name equals foo or something, right? But by default, it's gonna be derived from the name of the method, okay? And that's the name you should remember. And then I'm gonna say at registry dot inventor. So remember, it's gonna do dot inventors. That's the same as calling git inventors. So it'll give me the result of that collection, which in this case, just has one object, okay? So uh, we can actually true collection of inventors is empty. There should be at least one inventor, right? Seems fair, let's go ahead and run this. Okay, so there we are, there's the one inventor we got back by dereferencing the bean dot inventors, okay? Well, what about here? Here we have another configuration class. I mean, it's just a spring component. It happens to be a configuration class, but this applies to any spring component. And we have a constructor. And in the constructor, I need access to the to another bean's properties. So I could, of course, inject that other bean. But here, I can just say, give me the bean registry.inventors. So instead of injecting and having a cyclical tangle on that other bean, I can just dereference the collection itself and have that injected here for me. So the expression language, we evaluate in terms of this pound sign curly bracket curly bracket within these value annotations, okay? So this is not just for property placeholder resolution. You can access the spring expression language anytime you need to in the value annotation to configure things, okay? So that's gonna give me the collection of inventors. And here I'm just gonna print them out and you know I'll see the, uh, I can store them here, okay? So let's see if that works. So here we've got an annotation config application context, just like before, except now in, in, in addition to the simple config, which contains the registry, Right. In addition to that, I've also got the spell configuration right here, which has the constructor. And if this works, then we should see the, 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 the printout and we should be able to then inject or get a pointer to the spell configuration and then look at the array there. OK, let's run spring. Let's see what we get. OK, so the inventors, the inventions are that's what we had before. And of course, this test, you know, it's, it works already. Right. It's, it's saying. If I get the bean spell configuration and look at the inventions field, that's this right here, it should be the same as getting the bean called inventors or inventor registry and calling get inventors. And of course it is because it's the same exact reference. How convenient. So earlier on, I mentioned something pretty crazy and I'm not sure if people really appreciated what I was talking about. Did you know you can compile the spring expression language? This is one of those features that just blows my mind. We have the ability to compile to bytecode, you know, to create a, an AST out of your Spring expression language statements. Why would you want that? For the same reason you don't want to use PHP, right? PHP reevaluates the code on every single page refresh. That's a non-starter for any kind of scalable thing. You want to have an optimized form of that. And so then you get things like Zen cache and whatever, but that's just a hack. Here, we got the real thing. You compile your code, it gets run like bytecode next time, okay? So I've got a method. Let's go down here and look at the method here first. I've got a method called compilation mode, and I'm going to pass in a spell compiler mode and a property to dereference. Creating the spell parser configuration, passing in the compiler mode, and I'm getting the current class loader. You can pass in null, but it's useful if you want to like scope uh, to a particular class loader, the generated classes that will be loaded into that class loader. Then I'm going to pass in, I'm going to create the parser, passing in the configuration. Then I'm going to use the parser to parse this expression, which in this case is just going to be the name of our property. So it might be name or it might be nationality or whatever, okay? And then I've got a runnable. And all I'm doing here is I'm saying, assert that it's not null. Assert that the result of expression.getValue against Tesla is not null. So this runnable is using that expression to, to get a value, 
right? I'm, I'm asserting it's not no, but I'm also evaluating that expression. Every time this runner will get to run, it gets you know evaluated, okay? So now I'm gonna evaluate it once in this method called stopwatch. What is stopwatch? Well, taking the nano time, the start, running the thing, and then capturing the end time, and then comparing the difference, the stop from the start, right? So how long did it take to run this runnable? Okay, so that's part one. I'm capturing the first amount. So this this is the difference between the start and the stop time in, as a long, okay? I'm gonna run now a thousand more times. So in total, a thousand and one time this time, and then a thousand more. I'm gonna go through, create a thousand, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna run this dot stopwatch passing in the runnable and evaluating that expression a thousand more times, okay? So depending on the uh, compiler mode, either it's gonna run that compilation at some point and then subsequent runs will be faster or it'll just be forced to reevaluate it each time. And then finally, uh, I'm gonna calculate the average, right? I'm gonna go through the collection of longs, right? That's what this is, is a bunch of longs in a collection. And uh, I'm gonna go through it, map one, map to a long for each value. And I get this handy thing called summary statistics. This is actually part of Java. I feel like people don't know about this, but it's really useful. Uh, and it gives me in turn things like the average. So I can look at the average time taken for all the thousand subsequent runs. And I can just show that. So I'm gonna measure the first time before anything has been compiled because it only compiles after the first or maybe second or third, but at least the first run. And then I'm looking at the average of the subsequent runs, presumably by which point it has been compiled. So I wanna confirm that the average of course is less than the first one. And, uh, and then we print that out, okay? And then to confirm it's working, there is no like, Mm, accessor method or Boolean or something that you can check to make sure that the, the compilation worked. But there is a private field. I wish they would expose it. There's a private field called compiled AST. And you can get access to that with a little bit of a reflection chicanery here. And uh, I'm saying, okay, make this field, this Java Lang reflect field accessible, which is literally just field dot set accessible, right? If you look at that, there you go, right? And then I'm using the field to against the reference to the expression object, get access to the field called compiled AST. So I have this object called compiled AST stored in this variable, and I'm confirming it's null or not. If it's null, that means nothing was compiled. If it's not null, something was compiled, okay? So now I've got this code set up in such a way that the parameters are whether to compile or not, and the name of the property, so that I can defeat any, I don't know if there are any caches across the JVM, but this would defeat that. I'm accessing two different properties here. So. First time, compile, and remember this method returns whether it's compiled or not. This is confirming whether it's not compiled or not. Okay, a little confusing. So with the compiler mode being off, there is no compiler, thus this should be true because it's returning whether it's not compiled. Okay, and I'm dereferencing the field called name on the Tesla uh, inventor object. Here, it is not null and therefore this is false. It's a little confusing, I grant you. And uh, I'm saying compile ASAP basically as soon as you have an idea of what the shape of that thing should look like, compile it. There is one more option called mixed, but for our purposes, to keep it simple, we are gonna use immediate. In mixed mode, expression evaluation silently switches between interpreted and compiled over time. After a number of runs, the expression gets compiled. If it later fails, possibly due to inferred type information changing, then that will be caught internally and the system switches back to interpreted mode. It may subsequently compile it again later. This is pretty cool. This is like the, the just-in-time compiler. And actually you can see this is added years later in 4.1, which came out you know, after 2014, whereas the first version of Spring Framework 3 came out in 2009, right? So poor Andy has been just building us a better expression language all this time. Okay, we're using mix, which basically says compile ASAP. This says don't compile ever. But what I'm interested in is the immediate, when we force it to compile. So we can see the first run took, what is that? 167, 1,677,000, no, 16 million. 775,333 nanoseconds. And the compiler mode was immediate and the subsequent runs took 34,753 nanoseconds. And uh, that is to say it's 482 times on average faster than the very first time the thing ran. Nice, right? And this, is, this pays dividends in high sort of fast path code patches like in, in spring integration where you're moving messages across the bus and you know, millions of messages per second, the last thing you want to do is be constantly reevaluating the spring expression context. Now you don't have to. Really, really powerful. So we just talked about compilation, and this sort of naturally segues into one other kind of compilation about which I know you're curious, 
AOT, right? Graal VM native images. What happens when I try and compile this stuff into a native image? And yeah, it's not great. Because remember, you're doing reflection. You're doing, you're looking up a bean by its ID and you're trying to do, re you're trying to do things at runtime to invoke methods. And that reflection may evade, in, in fact, it probably does evade the compile time, the static analysis that determines which classes should be preserved in the heap and which classes reflective metadata should be preserved in the heap. So we need to explicitly make Spring aware of how you, of which classes you're using. And um, you know, there's a lot of frameworks where you might use the Spring expression language. If you want to create a GraalVM native image, you've seen my Spring Tips video before, presumably. You can use your own, you can create your own custom hints class like this, static class hints implements runtime hints registrar, like that. Okay, voila. And then pass that in here, right? And here, if you know that you're going to use a bean for, you know, reflectively, at, and I mean, that's not uncommon at all, of course, if you can use a spring bean via the spring expression language, make sure you register the beans class, okay? So if the bean is a register type, what is it? I don't know, inventor registry or something like that, whatever I called it, right? You can register that type and call member category dot values, right? Uh, what's another type? Let's just say, Whatever. Let's suppose I had a spring bean of type string, which I don't and you shouldn't, right? It's weird. But the point is you register the type and then you de define what met reflective metadata you want, fields, classes, etc. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. And this is what most people will do. Um, so the question then is, what if I want this to be in a more framework sort of way? What if I want to build something that relies on the spring expression language, for example, as an attribute in an annotation, a custom annotation, and I want to make sure that I do write by the users when they use my framework and this and use it, the spring expression language. Well, it's not hard to parse that spring expression language and to get access to the AST, the abstract syntax tree. And here's a fairly high exam, high level example by Marcus Correjo. He's on the spring team and he lives in Brazil uh, and he does all sorts of cool stuff. And I was just really enamored with this particular example. This is a spring framework, bean factory initialization, AOT processor that looks for the presence of spring expression language expressions in the new pre-authorized and post-authorized annotations in spring security, okay? And uh, I have a simpler version of what it's doing here, but suffice it to say, it's looking for the presence of an annotation, getting the annotation value, and then parsing it, okay? So let's actually look at a slightly easier to resolve uh, version of that. That I copied very much from that code, okay? so. Here's what's happening, okay, Where, where's my hair? So let's forget about the discovering annotation. That's a different problem. Let's say you have a spring expression language string, okay? So I'm gonna create a spell expression parser. I'm gonna parse the spring expression. Let's just say I've got this spring expression language statement, customer service UID. I'm calling the, where's my class? I'm calling UID on this bean, which is a spring bean, which I'm gonna run. You can see it's a public static void main spring boot application. And I'm calling dot UID, which is a method, okay? Simple spring expression language stuff. But of course, in a GraalVM context, if spring doesn't tell GraalVM about the type of customer service, then this will fail because there won't be any reflective metadata that we can use at runtime to then reflectively call dot UID, okay? So let's see how we get around that, okay? So here's the code. We have a spell expression language. We're parsing the spell using this method called parse raw. You've seen me use parse expression all this time, but we want raw. We want the spell expression object itself. By And then we get access to the AST, the abstract syntax tree, and it's got us a spell node. And here, we're gonna create a collection, a set of unique bean names. I'm gonna do a little recursion. So resolve bean names takes in the empty set of names and the spell node, and that takes us to here, right? The set of names and the spell node. And then we, and then we call, then we derive the name of the bean by using some reflection uh, hackery again to get access to the bean name from the bean reference to make that field accessible and then to return that string, okay? So if this is a bean reference and if the if the AST node that we're visiting is a bean reference, then we're done, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, if I had just called, if I had just done this, then that whole thing would be a bean reference, but I I didn't, I did two things. I called, I dereferenced the, the bean and then I called a method on it, right? So there's two, at least two nodes there, right? So. If the name is a bean reference, then just resolve the bean name by getting access to the bean reference itself and getting the private field called bean name. Great. Otherwise, look for the child count of the nodes. If there are zero child counts, then obviously that's a dead end return. Otherwise, recursively go through each child and look for whether each of those AST nodes 
is a bean reference. And if so, get the bean name, adding it as you go to this set, this dedupe set of bean names, okay? So this goes on here. And by the time you get to line 86, we've already got all the bean names. So now we're gonna return a contribution, right? That's the contract for this class. It's a, this method has to return a contribution object. And we're doing that. And that contribution con context, we're expressing as a Lambda. And we're gonna get the runtime hints. And then for each of the bean names in the bean name set, we're gonna get the bean definition, which is just the, uh, you know, the metadata, the reflective metadata type that backs the definition of our bean itself. Uh, and we're gonna get the bean class name. If it's not null, then all together now, we say Gravy register a hint for the type whose class is equal to this class name, and then, you know, support all kinds of reflection. And so we're looking up the type by looking up the bean, by looking up the bean by its name, which we get from the Spring Expression Language AST. How convenient is that? Really, really powerful. So now this will compile, right? So and wait, let's, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at it in action. I'm gonna comment this out and we'll compile the code in the background here. It'll fail. All right, so we compiled this into a Gravium native image and uh, you can see, hey, you're trying to call it, reflectively call a bean, a class type called custom service. You're trying to call the method called UID. The Gravium compiler was nice enough to even say, hey, you should register some reflection metadata for this type. No kidding, thank you for that, right? And again, it's not hard to do that. If you get that error and all you wanna do is support that one thing, then again, you, you would have just done this. You would have just said customer service the class and been done with it. But we want something more frameworky, right? We want something that applies to any use of the Spring Expression Language that we have access to. And of course, in this case, it's just the one variable. But imagine you also have some code to extract that Spring Expression Language statements from some custom annotation that you've written, okay? So here, I'm gonna restore this spell hints class, which is a bean factory initialization AOT processor. Spring's gonna involve this code at compile time. It's gonna do all of this and it's gonna register it's gonna find the bean name in that spring expression language. It's gonna register a reflective metadata hint with GraalVM at compile time so that at runtime when we call that UID, it knows what to do. Let's go ahead and let it compile again and I'll see you on the other side of it. Hey, there we go. The UID is, and we got a result back. The program started up in 40, thousands of a second, which is very good, thank you. And uh, it worked. So you can see we were able to easily sort of solve this problem. Uh, this is a bit more advanced. I appreciate that most of you will never have to do this. I just thought it was some really inspired code and I wanted to point it out to you and hat tip to Marcus as always for being a legend, okay? All right, my friends, I hope you got something out of that. I think the Spring Expression Language is super useful. It's in all sorts of places. It's in Spring Cloud Dataflow. It's in Spring Integration. It's in Spring Batch. It's in Spring Security. I think you can use it. In, you can also just use it in the regular Spring Framework, right? You can use it in Spring Webflow. You can use it in all sorts of places. I've only begun to scratch the surface here. But hopefully, now that you understand the lower level fundamentals of what's happening, you might find some use for it yourself, right? You need a, a quick, easy expression language that you can embed in your program, you got one. You wanna know what to do with the ones that are already there in Spring? Now you know. And you wanna do something really cool like compiling it to a native code? You can do that too, with a little bit of uh, care and, and finesse. And where appropriate, we're taking that same pattern in the places where we permit the use of the uh, Spring expression language, and we're doing that work as well. So hopefully you don't even have to care about it uh, in the native image context. But if you do experience an issue, let us know. And then optionally, if it's in your own code, maybe consider this pattern. I thought it was really cool. My friends, I hope you got something out of this. Thanks for watching as always, and uh, we'll see you next time.